Hello, I'm Kendall House, and this presentation is called Group Selection in Social Anthropology. Our goals in this presentation are three. So first, we're going to examine studies based on group selection that have been made in social anthropology. And in doing that, we're going to identify key assumptions in the approach called group selection. And that will lead us to differentiate selection between groups from selection within groups, which is one of our key learning objectives this semester. So if we look across social anthropology, we'll find that overwhelmingly most so social anthropologists endorse the assumptions of group selection, though they rarely give it very much thought. And these assumptions are that groups exist independently of their membership. They exist above and beyond their individual members. And this means that societies function for the good of the group as a whole. So we can refer to group level structures to explain individual behaviors and suggest that those individual behaviors are shaped by the society. In anthropology, this was perhaps given its clearest formulation in the middle of the 20th century by an anthropologist named Alfred Reginald Radcliffe Brown. And he called his approach structural functionalism on the structural side, he talked about social anatomy. And this was describing the structure of institutions in a society. An easy example would be a hierarchical structure in a society with individuals of different levels of power. He also talked about social physiology. And this referred to the functions of those institutions within the society. And we might, for example, suggest that the function of hierarchy is to create social order. So the structure was the anatomy of society. The function was the physiology. And behind this lay a metaphor called the organic analogy that suggests that a society is like a living organism. It has parts or components that function to sustain the whole. So just as your lungs have a function in your body and, you, and your heart has a function in your body and your central nervous system, the idea is the different institutions in a society are analogous to those organs in your body. And they only exist uh, to take care of that greater whole. Now later on, ecological anthropologists, who in many ways broke uh, with social anthropology, continued to focus on group selection and to use something like an organic analogy. But now they argued that social institutions function to maintain ecological balance among populations, at least in traditional small-scale human societies. So the issue for ecology in the 1960s was how is balance maintained? And there was discussion about homeostatic systems. So homeostasis is a state of being in balance. And the issue is how do you maintain that balance? Probably the example that you're most familiar with of a homeostatic system is temperature regulation in your body. So when you exercise, your blood vessels dilate, and this is combined with sweating uh, to produce cooling, to release that heat and cool your core temperature and bring it back down to the homeostatic level of 98.6. And likewise, when you get cold, your blood vessels constrict and you undergo shivering, and this helps to raise your body temperature back up towards 98.6. So the point of balance is 98.6. And whenever you move outside of that balance, there's organic processes that occur that help to bring your body back to its balancing point. And the idea is that ecological systems seek these same kind of balances among the populations within them. 
So in applying Win Edwards group selection approach, one anthropologist really stands out, and this is Roy Rappaport, who died the same year as Win Edwards, 1997. And Rappaport went and did his dissertation work in Papua New Guinea and wrote a famous book called Pigs for the Ancestors. And this book applied Win Edwards' approach to understanding ritual processes among the Simbaga Maring. So the people here, you probably can't make out the spelling from just hearing it, are the Simbaga Maring of Papua New Guinea. And the study was done in the early 1960s and published originally in 1968. So the idea that Rappaport had was that warfare, which was rather ritualized, might operate as a homeostatic process or it might help keep a balance in the human populations in the area. So we had two populations of interest to Rappaport. One was the human numbers, and he suggested that territories were adjusted through cycles of warfare so that no group had surplus population or too little population for the amount of area that they occupied. But they also relied on pigs, and the pig population also had to be maintained stably. And Rappaport pointed out that as part of the rituals that involved warfare, there were also rituals that involved the slaughter of pigs and that this then would bring the pig population back into balance. So these rituals uh, were called Kaiko, the rituals that uh, began a cycle of warfare and involved pig slaughter. And following Win Edwards, Rappaport referred to these rituals as epidectic displays. And you may recall that an epidectic display conveys information about overcrowding. So Wynne Edwards was focused on bird species, not humans, and he argued that there's different ways that animals communicate epidectically, that overcrowding is occurring, and this induces balance-restoring behaviors in that population. And this was the position then that Rappaport took about the ritual process of the Simbaga Maring. So first let's look at the pig cycle independently of the human cycle and we're simplifying greatly because when we look at the details of human systems they're almost overwhelming and it would take us a very long time to set it all out. But let's start the pig cycle at a point where there are just too many pigs. The pig population has grown and the pigs expanded quite slowly among the marine because of a number of factors. But when they reached a high level, it caused a lot of signals of stress. And this included pigs invading people's gardens and eating their root crops, as well as fights among people over pigs and people having to work too hard to help maintain the pigs. So those cycles of stress then led to the uprooting of a plant called the rumban. And this would occur along the boundaries between two peoples who would later go to war, they would ceremonially go out and remove these rumbrin plants and then they would slaughter pigs and eat them. So the removing of the rumbin is an epidectic display signaling too many pigs. This would lead to the Kaiko rituals that precede warfare and along with these rituals, the pigs would be slaughtered, all but a number of younger ones that would rebuild the pig population. And this then would bring the pig population back into balance. And at some point in the future, when the pig population was down to its limits again, it was very low, the Rumban bush would be replanted. But there was another cycle that was linked to this pig cycle in a very complex manner and that also was signaled by the Rumbrin uprooting and replanting, and this was the warfare cycle. So again, a simplified version of the warfare cycle will start with the uprooting of the Rumbrin bush, and that's the epidectic display that sets in motion 
behaviors that balance populations out again. In this case, it took the form of a fairly ritualized kind of warfare with neighbors that in some cases, if the balance was really uneven though, might lead to the near destruction of neighboring peoples and the scattering them among their allies. That warfare then was followed by a replanting of the Rumban, which, saw, which indicated the return of peace. And the Rumban, when it was replanted, might be replanted in such a way as to change the boundaries of groups. So if our group went out to uh, Group A and destroyed Group B, when it was time to replant the Rumban, instead of putting it back where it was, we'd walk into their territory and say it was unoccupied and we would take their territory now as our territory. So the idea is that territorial boundaries were readjusted through these cycles of warfare. And in doing that, they came to balance out the human populations relative to the amount of territory they had. If our group wasn't large enough to defend our territory, we'd be pushed aside by a more populous group who needed more land. So let's summarize here. What was the function of ritual warfare? Well, to quote Rappaport, it was the maintenance of optimal population dispersal at a minimum expense in blood. So he argued that it wasn't the case that the Marine were trying to destroy their neighbors, but rather that the way these rituals worked uh, was to minimize blood loss while renegotiating boundaries. And in this sense, then, we could say that warfare worked to restore balance and homeostasis in the local population systems, both of pigs and of humans. So now let's connect this, uh, go back to group selection again. So the idea is that in group selection, the interest of the group suppress the interest of individuals. An example of this would be soldiers in the military. They have to give up their own best interest and do what the group needs, even if they lose their lives in the course of that. And the second is then that a level of competition is not between individuals, but it occurs at the group level. And this means that selection can operate at the group level. And some groups will dominate over other groups and be uh, survive and other groups will lose out and be destroyed. And we can see this again in military conflicts or sporting events and all of these group level activities that there's this complex interaction between individual interest and group interest. But you have to work for the team if your team is going to win. Now as it happens, Darwin anticipated the arguments for group selection. And in a famous passage, he said that when two tribes came into competition, other things being equal, if the one tribe included more courageous and faithful members who were always ready to defend each other, that tribe with the more courageous and faithful members would succeed and conquer the other. So that's page 113 in his 1871 work, The Descent of Man which is now out of copyright, so we don't have to know to copyright a publisher. However, as it happened, Darwin quickly anticipated key weaknesses in arguments for group selection, and he said it's extremely doubtful whether the offspring of those most faithful to their comrades, this is the individuals in the group who are most likely to sacrifice themselves for others for the benefit of the group, it is doubtful that their offspring would be raised in greater numbers than the children of selfish parents who did not sacrifice themselves. So he who was ready to sacrifice would often lead no offspring to inherit his noble nature. So now we kind of have a conundrum here. The group with the greater number of altruists is going to be victorious over a selfish group, it would appear, but the altruists within any group are going to lose out to the more selfish. So how can this work? And it became conventional then to talk about levels of selection. And two key levels of selection are, one, selection between individuals within groups. And in this case, presumably the selfish win unless 
reciprocal altruism or inclusive fitness is at play. And then another level of selection is between groups of individuals. And in those contests, presumably the groups with the most altruist win. And the issue came to be, does selection act at both levels at once, right? Or does it act more strongly at one level than another? And this came to be called the levels of selection debate or the units of selection debate. The question in that debate is just who is evolution good for? Is it good for the group or is it good for the individual or is it good for the gene? And we're going to look at that debate next. And thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this.